So welcome back after lunch. I'm Jeff Salingo. I'll be introducing myself a little bit more later because I'll be speaking at, uh, at dinner. But I've been writing about higher education for more than two decades, uh, former editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education, and always been kind of fascinated with Northeastern uh, University because it's always been kind of a le at the leading edge of so many trends uh, in, in the world. Uh, it was at the leading edge of uh, cooperative education um, uh, more than a, a century ago, um, uh, and then a number of other universities uh, copied it. Uh, uh, President Anoon, who will be speaking in a few minutes, uh, when he's been talking about global higher education uh, before everybody else has been uh, doing it. And now, um, uh, Joe Anoon, uh, who uh, has been president now for 12 years, uh, at Northeastern uh, University, just wrote this book last year called Robot Proof, Higher Education in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And what fascinated me in reading the book was that a, a college president, a university president, was talking about an issue that we're all talking about today that very few, I think, if any, of his counterparts are talking about and the role higher education needs to play in this new society. So I think, yet again, uh, Northeastern University and President Yoon is at the, at the forefront of another trend here. So uh, President Yoon is, uh, is going to talk for a few minutes uh, about the book and about his work, and then uh, we're gonna do a little fireside chat and take questions from the audience as well. So without any further ado, uh, President Joe Yoon from Northeastern University. Thank you, thank you very much. I <coughs> thank you, I, it took me 24 hours to get here, and I, you know, people started blaming uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So I came here to ask you to please fix it and help me get back uh, in a kind of sane way. So <coughs> I'm here uh, to, you know, first and foremost for a dialogue. And uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about how um, I came to start thinking about the implication of AI uh, in higher education and the culprits are you because essentially, you know, higher uh, uh, artificial intelligence is displacing many people. And uh, you, you know, you all know, you all heard about that. I think Moshe talked about it, I heard uh, this morning, that up to 50% of the jobs we know are going to disappear in the next 20 years. There will be new jobs, inequalities are going to increase, et cetera, et cetera. You are responsible, you are the culprits for that. And, but you are also educators. And being educators, we have a responsibility. And what is our mission, what is our responsibility is to make people robot-proof. Now, how do we make a, a people robot-proof? Uh, becoming robot-proof is a journey. I was uh, sitting at lunch uh, for a little bit with some colleagues and there was a debate about, you know, are we pushing our students to specialize a lot, et cetera, et cetera, or is it better to have a rounded education? So. What I'm going to uh, provide is a, you know, a kind of blueprint for how we can uh, help our learners become robot-proof for life. Starting with uh, the undergraduate students, I refer to them as the people who are short on experience, long on time. And therefore the question is, what is it, how can we help them become uh, robot-proof? What I'm <coughs> suggesting is that every learner at this stage should master what I call humanics. And humanics is the integration of three literacies. Uh, tech literacy, understanding how machines work and how to interact with machines. Uh, data literacy, understanding the sea of uh, information generated by uh, machines and how to navigate that. And the third literacy is the human literacy. And what is the human literacy is what humans can do, what we humans can do that machines cannot do as well for the time being unless you keep winning. And what are uh, these attributes? The ability to be innovative, creative, entrepreneurial, the ability to be empathetic, to work with people uh, and uh, to empathize with them, uh, to the ability to be culturally agile, the ability to be global, all these attributes that we, we have mastered for thousands and thousands of years as humans. And what I'm advocating is that it is not the fact that, you know, you take a course in uh, uh, tech literacy, another one in digital literacy, data literacy, and a third one 
in, in uh, human literacy, but a full integration. And I'll be happy to discuss uh, that more. But, we, you know, when we say that every learner should master humanics and the integration of three literacies, the question is how are we going to do that? You can spend a lot of time studying uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, creativity, empathy, working with other people, but if you don't practice it, uh, this is not going to uh, uh, get you there. And this is why I'm advocating for experiential uh, education. And what is experiential education? It's the integration of the classroom experience with the world experience. It can be done in many ways, including those co-ops that Jeff mentioned, which are the long-term internships, including the fact that uh, you are uh, involved in uh, uh, extramural activities or even in uh, knowledge creation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, why is it the case that I'm focusing on experiential education? I'm focusing on experiential education because experiential education allows the learners to move their knowledge and test their knowledge from a domain, a context to another. Machines have not been very good at that, are not very good at that. The other aspect is that through experiential education, you understand what you're good at, what you're not good at. You understand <coughs> what others uh, are good at. You understand how to interact with others. You understand how to be able to look people in the eye, understand their body language, understand how to work with other people, how to be culturally agile. You know, when, when you, you know, different cultures express themselves in different ways, etc., etc. So what I'm advocating essentially is the integration of experiential education as a fundamental aspects of what we do. So what I said so far, and I'm being very <coughs> uh, fast on purpose in order to allow for more exchange, what I said two things, very simple. With, you know, every learner <coughs> starting her journey has to master something I call humanics, which is the integration of three literacies, and the way to do it is by via experiential education. However, you are bad people, bad people because you are not stopping your progress and you are not stopping your achievements. Namely, you are going to displace more jobs, you are going to perfect your, uh, what you're doing even more, which means that no one is set for life. You know, when I, <coughs> I went to college, people told me with a BS degree or a BA degree or a master's or even a PhD, you're set for life. No one is set for life. Why? Because of you. Because you keep this, you know, uh, moving the agenda forward and you will displace more uh, jobs and you will create new opportunities too. And the third aspect on, on you know, this robot-proof journey is to embrace lifelong learning. We all need to embrace it. We all need to re-educate ourselves, upskill ourselves, retool, otherwise we become obsolete. And this is an issue that is interesting because we are all educators too, one way or another. And higher education has not embraced lifelong learning as <coughs> a core mission. Actually, we look at lifelong learning as being a second class operation, done maybe to make money, but look at how we are treating that. And in the United States, only in the United States, 68% of the learners are already lifelong learners. And in the next five to 10 years, the projection uh, is that 85% of the learners will be long, lifelong learners. Namely, the people we're educating, the 18 to 22, already are a minority and will become a minority. On the other hand, you guys are in a, an enormous growth in lifelong learning. And if we don't embrace it in higher education, it is, you know, others, uh, it is the case that others will embrace it, companies or for profits, and I'll discuss that more. But you say, okay, what's the big deal? Let's embrace it. Let's embrace it in higher education. It's easier said than done because essentially we built everything, our model, in, along the lines of we will build them and they will come. When you have lifelong learners, those are people who are short on time, long on experience. So they don't have the luxury to come back to us and be with us in, uh, on, on, uh, on our campuses. 
they don't have the luxury on time, of time. So we have to start thinking about how we can provide education that is on demand, how we can provide how we can go and meet the learner wherever she is. And this is something that's totally new to us. Even the notion of degree and the notion of credentialing has to be rethought, and you all know what's happening, the notion of micro-certificates, stackable certificates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition, lifelong learning is something that employers are very interested in, but employers are interested also in outcomes, which is going to force us to sit down with employers and say, well, what is the outcome that you want? And to work and build our curricula, our certificates, stackable certificates along these lines. So what I'm saying is that for us, embracing a lifelong learning will require us to put up with reality. And we don't like it very much. So that will be a departure. Lifelong learning is going to get us to think about customized offerings, personalized offerings, and that is a departure for us. Now, if already the majority of learners is there and we're ignoring them, then there is a risk for us to become non-relevant. And I'll be happy to discuss that more. But let me <coughs> mention that we, the, we became educators because we believe that we want to provide opportunities for everyone. And our society has been based on equality of opportunities. And we looked at edu education as providing th those opportunities. So what I'm saying is that now society is polarized and society is divided into what, quoting somebody very prominent in Silicon Valley, he told me that society will be divided more and more into masters and slaves. The purpose of education is to have free people and not to have slaves. So what I'm saying is that that is our mission, and what I'm saying is that becoming robot-proof is a journey, and this journey we have to provide the learners with the opportunities to lead it. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're I'm going to open up with a few questions. I have a ton to ask you, but uh, I know I think the audience does as well. So let's, uh, I want to talk about the reality of, of higher education um, today, uh, which is to me, at least in the time that I've covered it, and even looking back through history, is, is very short-term oriented. Meaning, um, you know, you've been president for, at Northeastern for what, 12 years now? Yes. Um, you know, the average tenure of a college president is seven, um, and even shorter. Six now, right? No, it's less than five. Less than five. Um, uh, you know, most students come in, uh, according to the UCLA freshman survey, uh, for generations they would come into college wanting to learn something. Now they come in looking for a job. Uh, that's the number one reason they go to college, according to the UCLA freshman survey that comes out uh, every, every year. So what you're talking about in your book requires us to think more long term, thinks higher education to think more long term. As you've been going around the country since the book came out in, in the fall, what's been the reaction, especially among your colleagues and counterparts in higher education? In other words, is, is higher ed well prepared right now to deal with the issues that you deal with in your book? Or do you think other fundamental changes have to happen first for higher education, whether it's the students, whether it's the faculty, whether it's presidents, whether it's boards? It seems like you're well aligned at Northeastern but how do we get the rest of higher education to kind of come along? You know, the last thing I want to do is to preach to my colleagues in higher education, especially that we have the president of Carnegie Mellon here, and he's still new and he's still smiling. So uh, let me tell you, I have been talking all over uh, the nation in various universities, uh, you know, ranging from Ivy League uh, to small liberal arts colleges to uh, uh, 
talking to presidents, as a meaning of presidents to uh, also uh, boards. And what is interesting is that the one of the mm, uh, recurring question is we buy into that, it makes sense, we want to do it, but how do you do change in higher education? That's something that is recurring. And uh, I believe th th there is an answer. And the answer is a very pragmatic answer. In higher education, what we do before starting something new, we all want to vote on that. So we request a vote. And once you request a vote, that's it. Nothing happens. Where, whereas, in fact, if we believe in a culture of experimentation and innovation, uh, you know, every time there is a change, you have three groups. A small group of early adopters, a small group of naysayers, and the large majority is what? In between, wait and see. Correct? So rather than voting, we, we can empower the early adopters to run with it, to be the proof, to be the models. So it's no longer about you. It's about them carrying everything and showing the rest how to make it happen. And I think that's one, one issue. So to answer your question, Jeff, I think my colleagues, the presidents, are very aware of that. Mm -hmm. And the issue that is being raised is how to make the change a reality. Okay, so then let's talk about some of the details that you brought up in, in, in the few minutes that you talked with us and about humanics, um, which is a big piece of your, your book, um, which kind of combines these technical and, and social skills. Can that be delivered in your mind through the traditional undergraduate curriculum we have now? I quoted you in a piece I did for the Chronicle a couple of weeks ago where I said we kind of have to rethink majors as we have them today, and boy, did I get pushback. Uh, um, I, I, because I people see disciplines equal departments equal majors. Do you think the, the way you have described humanics can be delivered through the traditional undergraduate curriculum that exists at the vast majority of colleges and universities You're today? You're packing many things in your question. Okay. I always do that. I always do. So let, let me try. You, then you have a choice of which yes. part to answer. No, but <laughs> it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great question because in some ways, uh, look, uh, what I'm talking about is an integration between the three uh, literacies through humanics, which means that if you take a course in, let's say, uh, human literacy, what I call human literacy, and take another course, in uh, tech literacy or digital or uh, data literacy, you yeah, that's not the point. There is no integration. But for instance, I can give you an example. You know, we have our uh, yeah, our academic plan, our strategic plan is based on that. So it's a you know, and it's work in progress, and it has been embraced by the faculty and by my colleagues. And the whole idea is to provide. So for instance, uh, in in computer science. Yeah, uh, to give you a, sim a simple example, and frankly al also simplistic example, uh, all the students uh, go for improv. And I was surprised when this was launched. Why do you want students to go for improv? So the, you know, the, the dean and the faculty made the case that in fact through that, they are really in integrating you know, the, the two aspects of uh, what they are doing. So two years later, we surveyed the students and they said this was transformational. So that's a simplistic example, but that's not as an example of integration. Once again, the example of integration has to be done by the, our faculty and by our colleagues because they are carrying it. Well, thank God, thank God there is something that's happening in uh, research. Research, and you know, ask my colleague, research is, is becoming extremely interdisciplinary and extremely translational. Now, what happens in higher education? Research is the model, and then learning is modeled after research. If you, you know, so you all know that. You want to, stu to study cyber, you know, to do research in cybersecurity and have a center, you need to have people who are not only in computer science, but people studying privacy, et cetera, et cetera. You have people looking at various aspects from uh, the, you know, behavior of psychology to, and, I can give you examples, but why should I do it? You, you know better than I do about that. So the re because now research is becoming translational, 
and uh, interdisciplinary, yeah, the, you know, interdisciplinary and translational, I am seeing a more receptivity towards integration. Mm -hmm. uh, be, because historically in higher education, the model for learning at the undergraduate level is a, frankly, let's look at it this way, is a watered down version of graduate education. So I see, I see changes, I see signs of uh, ha uh, happening. Look at also from a learner perspective, the uh, combined majors, the double majors, they're exploding nationwide. Right, and so that's students a sign. want this. Exactly. Want this. And, I, and what you said, I like you, Jeff, and I agree with you about majors. Majors are not uh, you well, know, the Well, the question I think becomes, do we have to organize the students like we organize the faculty? Understand that disciplines are needed, but given what you talk about in the book, do, do the stu does the undergraduate experience for students need to be organized as the faculty? I, and we know that's not the case uh, in many places uh, that they organize it uh, around themes, around challenges, around whatever it is. So yes, I think once again, we, the reason we're doing, you know, we, we look, we have uh, the, the majors is that it became because we let, we are allowing the graduate model to lead the, the undergraduate, undergraduate model. So let's talk, uh, speaking of graduate education, we've always thought of lifelong education in, in higher education as something that you would, you would leave your undergraduate years, you'd go work for a couple of years, you'd come back, you'd get graduate education or professional education, and then you'd essentially be done. We know, and as you mentioned, lifelong learning is going to become increasingly important. Um, is higher education at risk here of losing that market? You, I know Northeastern did a survey recently with, uh, with Gallup, and if I remember correctly, a large number of people, workers, know they are going to need continual education. But when you ask them where they're going to get that from, most of them said, a large majority, if I remember correctly, said they're going to need to get it from their employers. Absolutely. Um, that was really surprising to me. So me too. they see higher education as something that they have early in their life, and then the learning for them later in life is done by employers. But if fewer people are going to be working for traditional employers in the future, is that necessarily the, the best way to get this lifelong yeah, learning? What, what Jeff was referring to is a survey we did with Gallup of people at all ages and in all professions about AI and uh, their attitude uh, towards AI. What surprised us is that only 37% looked at higher education as providing lifelong learning. And that is a matter of concern because if you look at employment in the United States, the average employment overall in companies is, all, is around four plus years. In Silicon Valley is less than two years. So therefore an employer doesn't have necessarily, you know, the impetus and the incentive to provide that. And, and the public at large is looking, as Jeff said, at <coughs> employers to provide that. And Jeff is alluding to the fact that the gig economy is the fastest growing economy in the nation sector of the economy in the nation. So, which means that lifelong learning is a necessity and people, uh, you know, the learners are not looking at us as the providers and companies, in fact, if you talk to them and we talk a lot to them, they tell you, look, we are in the education, uh, they, they call them universities, IBM universities, uh, GE university, PVH university, and they tell you we are in, in this for two reasons. One is because we want them to get the culture of the place, which is fine, but the second is because you are not meeting our needs. You're not flexible enough. You're not giving us uh, chunks that we can use, the, those badges, certificates, nano, whatever it is, and also you don't sit down with us and work with us on the outcomes. Well, and then they go a step further. They say, this is not our core competence. We prefer not to do it. But we're doing it because there is a gap. And that is worrisome. So we, you know, that is an opportunity for higher education. I personally believe, what, you know, that it, 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 people say, oh, peop, you know, higher education, if we in higher education, we say people don't like us. I believe that this is the golden age of higher education because you have an enormously growing demand and we have the opportunity to be the only legitimate provider 
and that's lifelong learning. I mean, perhaps uh, workers are, are thinking that way because higher education is expensive. So have you thought about if we're going to need to get education continually throughout our lives, how does a university like Northeastern price that? How do you yeah. allow people to afford it throughout their lives yeah. as they continue to move through so their careers? So first, don't, don't think about a commitment for a degree. Think about uh, you know with th those chunks that I mentioned, the certificates the, and the stackable certificates. Second, if you look at what's happening in lifelong learning, it's what happened in plastic surgery in the United States. Plastic surgery is not reimbursed by uh, the insur by insurance. What happened? Prices plummeted. Correct. That's what's happening in high in uh, lifelong learning. The cost, if you look in the United States about the cost of lifelong learning and the cost of certificates, et cetera, is going down. Meaning when it's not covered by a federal uh, because, financial aid. Because the, pro the professional is essentially not covered. Right. And so, what, you know, and it's, it goes down. That's why you are seeing, you know, the audacity of this world. You are seeing uh, chunking being done and you are seeing attempts to say, look, if you take Coursera or edX, then you can move into, uh, you know, us. But what is it? The, the, the prices are, are, are really low from this perspective. So you you are going to see more and more uh, uh, recalibration of the of the pricing at this level. Absolutely. Okay, I want to uh, talk about one more issue, and that's about ethics and equity um, and the role higher education plays in this future. And then we'll open it up for for questions from, from the audience. So we started this morning with what I call the utopian view uh, of, of the future of, of work, uh, and then we moved into the somewhat dystopian view uh, of that, um, which tends to, these discussions about the future of work and AI tend to be very positive or very negative, but there's, it's never in the middle. So I kind of want to know, A, where you stand. Is this, a, is this a positive development, a negative development, or, or where is it in the middle? But second, as I was looking at um, some of the statistics and, and some of the work that we heard this morning, I worry right now um, higher education is being criticized for widening the inequities in, in the U.S. right now. Uh, we know from work uh, that Rod Chetty at, at Stanford has done uh, that you know, a large number of people who've gone to the most elite and most selective colleges in the country over the last couple of decades come from essentially the very top income levels of, of the U.S. Um, and as a result, as you know, a number of colleges are really looking at trying to better serve uh, low-income students. University of Chicago just announcing yesterday around the SAT, ACC. So two questions here. One, um, are you positive? Are you optimistic about this future? Uh, is this a more utopian uh, a view of the world? Uh, and second, what role do you think higher education should play and how should it play in making sure that whatever this world becomes because of AI, we don't widen the inequities that we already see in education? I'm optimistic in the following way. If I tell you tomorrow, stop your research, you look at me and you say, this guy's crazy. And you, your research is driving the change. And your research is not going to stop. So it's not your research that worries me. It's the attitudes that people have. You know, and what, let, let me be very clear. When you have people saying, for instance, AI should be uh, taxed, so you know, Gates did that, or AI should be regulated and we should stop, you can't do that. What you have to, what you have to do is look at the consequences. And, you know, the inequality, I understand, I got my report, Moshe, that you talked about the fact that this is not the first time that's happening. And that, but the acceleration is going to be more important that because the last one, uh, more dramatic, the last uh, change took us, to, it, it took, us, it took us two years, 200 years to adjust, correct? That's my report. Uh, and I, so from this perspective, you know, what, I worry about is not the long term. I worry about the next 20 to 30 years. But after that, I'll be dead. Uh, the, because you are going to, be, to have many people who will be left out. And this is the opportunity for us in higher education to rethink the notion of equality of opportunity. And that's my answer in the following way. If you look at 
you know, when the move from when we move from the agrarian uh, revolution to the industrial revolution, people said people need education, education, and therefore we made schooling mandatory. You remember that? Well, you don't remember that. You read about it because you're only too young for that. Then when, similarly afterwards, we said, ah, with the Industrial Revolution, we need to have departments of chemistry, engineering, the professional, etc. But we always looked at education as providing the opportunity. And it inched upward, historically. Not only in our society, look at the European societies, look at now what's happening in Asia, etc. Now, if you look at what what's happening now with the need for lifelong learning. The need for lifelong learning is going to push us to think about equality of opportunities over a lifetime. Namely, we have to provide as a society opportunities for people to re-educate themselves, to re-skill themselves, to upskill themselves. Now, you tell me, how are you going to do it? Well, there are many, many proposals, and I don't know whether they were discussed this morning or not, for instance, a portable account for each citizen that will allow her to uh, have a lifelong learning account. The, uh, some countries are testing that. In Denmark, they are testing this. And we have to rethink the notion of equality of opportunity in, say, this is a challenge that will be with us lifelong and society has to come forward and support it. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, you're much more optimistic than I am about this. We can barely get, you know, more, a little bit more than, only about half of our students through college, right? So if we can't even, even, if students who are apt to go to college now can't barely, can barely get through, how, do, how are we gonna get all these people who don't even participate in the higher education system we have today, Be how are they going to be able to self-direct their learning throughout life? But not, That's what no, 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 no. There is a difference between having a portable account that will allow them to partake into lifelong learning and self-direction. Mm -hmm. This is an account that is sponsored by the government that will allow you, in the same way that you have financial aid, you will have a portable account for life. Mm -hmm. And then every time you want to take uh, you know, courses and lifelong learning. But I guess, I, I guess what I'm but asking is, is there somebody then to help them, guide them And that's that the role of higher education. Okay. For instance, let me give you an example okay. that you just said. You, we, people, the notion of lifelong learning also is going to be rethought. It is not lifelong learning for people who went to college, but also for people who failed to go to college. Okay. You know, and the, you have to allow citizens at any level in their lives to be to reeducate themselves or educate themselves or reskill themselves or upskill themselves it's, it's it 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 is not the purview of people who went to college right. only right because that's what i think will uh, increase the inequities we already have absolutely okay let's open this up for some uh, questions and we'll start right here at the first table yes can i ask uh, you a favor a i don't know everyone if you can tell me who yeah. you are and what what you do and I'll be very grateful to you. Thank you. Moshe Vardy, Rice University, computer scientist. I want to follow up on really on the, on the point that you just addressed. So especially I think here we mostly represent not just higher education, but the four year plus higher education, a particular segment of higher education. And you know, we made a huge effort, I think, you know, GI Bill, et cetera, to push more people to, to get higher education. But the number of, of the percent of four people who finish a four-year degree, I think, is about one third. Yes, yeah. it's a little bit under. Yeah, it's yes. a little bit more than that. It's a little over yeah. forty percent. Go ahead. Four-year degrees. Four year, uh, who finish in four years? Yes. Four but year but the, what the data shows that the people who have less, who do not complete a four-year degree, they're not doing much better. They're doing, they're doing a little better economically than people with high school degrees, but not much better. And especially in some segments, for example, if you go at Rice University, we are at the stratosphere, right? We're saying we educate the, the, leader of tomorrow, the leaders of tomorrow. What about everybody else? Not our problem. And I mean, we're not saying it, but we're behaving essentially in that way. And when you look at where is technology hitting people, it's hitting people with high school degree, with, with a maybe associate degree. And now we are talking about, you know, this is a, something like, you know, maybe 60% yeah. of the population. Yeah. 
And so there is a really question of which is how do we take this, I would say, the particular, the four year plus segment of higher education and say, well, you really need to somehow find a way to broaden your mission. You can't just say we're educating the leaders and everybody else, we don't care. Look, I can't agree more with you. First of all, let me tell you that it's, there are various projections that the four year captive learner is disappearing. Actually, if you look at the, some earlier versions of some strategic planning done at MIT and other places like seven years ago, they said, we, we cannot count on having four-year uh, students anymore. They can start in uh, Singapore, then go to, uh, a, let's say, London, and then come here. So that's one. The notion of four-year being very stable is, uh, is shaking. The, s the second aspect, I believe what you are raising is a question of take K to gray. And higher education has two responsibilities, to move to the K to 12, and second, also to go into the lifelong learners, including the ones who are not into the four, four year. If, for instance, I can tell you, uh, and this is a little bit self-serving, so I apologize for that, we started workshops for, uh, a for uh, a K through 12 educators. In, uh, a, and this year we have 200 uh, schools and school systems from United States and Canada because th they, they want to move into experiential education and they want to create a network. So we, th the pipeline, we have to look at the pipeline. And the pipeline, it, you know, we, let's face it, in the United States we have great university, lousy, schools and we got away why because of uh, immigration because we have an open system that allows people like me who's an immigrant or the uh, you know the president of Carnegie Mellon to become president of Carnegie Mellon even even though he s started in Iran okay but we have an issue so I would start with that the second issue is precisely the uh, the, the one you mentioned namely the uh, community colleges. The community colleges are, have the largest majority of learners now at all age brackets, and we have neglected that. We as a system, so if every university will tell you I'm doing X, Y, and Z, but that's something we have to integrate. So my, my answer is our mission in higher education is take K to gray, and we better wake up to that. And there are things I can spend 10 minutes explaining what I think we can do. And I'm sure you'll spend 20 minutes doing that. But your point is very well taken. We also got away with lousy schools because we had jobs for just high school graduates, which we don't have anymore. Yeah. Yes, right here. Hi, I'm Chris Alaroquez from uh, Boston University. So in your remarks, you mentioned lifelong learning, but you did not define it precisely. If by lifelong learning you meant offering content, courses, certificates for lifelong learners, then as you said, in, we know that in an information economy, the value and price of content converges to zero, right? If that's what you mean by lifelong learning. Uh, so what's the question? The question is, first of all, define lifelong learning for us, your vision of lifelong learning. And if you mean lifelong learning as being content, courses, certificates, whatever, is this sustainable in a world where the, 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 the value of undifferentiated content will converge to zero and there are lots of alternatives. You see, providers. you are speaking like an educator. <laughs> Whereas I, I mentioned lifelong learning is about the learner. It's not about the content. There is a need for people at any stage to educate themselves, to reskill themselves and upskill themselves. Let's think about it in terms of the learner. Don't think about it in terms of the content, because if you think about it in terms of the content, we're back to the idea that we will build them and they will come. Somebody has to meet uh, uh, the uh, need for learners at any stage of their lives, from K to gray. And somebody has to, to provide it. And what's happening in the United States is that we decided that for people who are post certain age, we are not providing that. The companies are providing that and the for-profits are providing that. So that's, I will not define it with respect to content, 
and we find it with respect to demand. And we have economists here. Okay. Yes, question in the back. We have a lot of questions, so I want to try to get to all of them. No Raise worries. your hand and the microphone will come to you. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Jaron Kozad. I'm actually the black sheep in the audience. I uh, work for somebody who hires your students. So Which what is uh, with I, what? So I did work for IBM, and I've recently made the transition to uh, Mountain America Credit Union. I'm the vice president of talent development there. Great. Um, so I do participate in the third-party groups that offer the lifelong learning, such yeah. as the plural sites and the canvases and the bridges and, and the third-party institutes. What is the best way you suggest businesses approach colleges to provide the courses that people are after? Because I have all the data yeah. of what courses yeah. my yeah. employees are taking. Okay. Look, I, I have examples. We have the provost from uh, Maryland, correct? We, we have people from Maryland here. Maryland sat down with, uh, a, you know, the Northrop Grumman and launched something about cyber. We did the same, our advanced ma nano manufacturing and mass manufacturing with GE. With IBM, we went a step further. IBM built 5,000 badges. And those badges are mini, mini nano certificates. And we looked at them, each one, and we said, all the people who have, uh, who went through these badges will uh, be in uh, integrated. This will count for whatever uh, next step they want to have. So my answer, the best way, and I can give you many examples from your institutions, the best way, sit down, as you know, with the universities, with the you know university around you, we in university have to look at it differently, as I said, because we have to look at it with more humility, because we created a monopoly for ourselves for uh, you know building the curricula. We're not asking you to build the curricula, but we're asking you to tell us what outcomes you're looking for, and we have examples. Case Western, uh, Urbana, uh, Maryland, Northeast, uh, many places. So sit down and talk. A question in the back, and then the microphone could come up here. Uh, Vikram Ardway, I'm also in computer science at Illinois. Um, you mentioned two year community colleges, and I actually strongly agree. I think that is one important vehicle for expanding the training. There's a lot more people who are going to be successful in that model. But my question to you is what role can four-year universities play? I think that in particular, four-year universities have this, you can almost call it a sense of ego in the United States that community colleges are somewhat looked down on or treated as a sort of secondary form of education. And what we do is, the, is, is where it's at. And I think that's a serious deficiency of the four-year system. So my question to you is, what can we as four-year universities do to expand to a much broader range of people, in particular in the form of uh, two-year degrees, okay. vocational training, and so on? That's also a great, a great question, because essentially you are saying, incidentally, I wasn't the one who raised the issue about co uh, community colleges, it's Moshe who did it, just, uh, but look, the issue is cultural, the is and the, the culprits are us. You are the university. Every faculty is a university. We have faculty who have launched programs, for instance, to go work with community colleges on building curricula, on, on doing the transition, etc. You know, it's in our hands. For God's sake, we have tenure. We can do whatever we want. And, but culturally, culturally, you know, the, I understand what you're saying. But the answer is in our hands. You know, we're saying pe we look down at community colleges. It's true. We look down at uh, community colleges. Let me mention something. Community colleges are very eager uh, to work on uh, articulation agreements that will allow their students to continue should they wish to do it with four years. We resist that. So we can start with something as simple as that. We can, the other aspect is that they need help in shaping their curricula. We, we can do that. And there are examples in the nation happening, especially in, public, uh, in the public sector of higher education, because there is a pressure on public higher education to work with community colleges that you are seeing in various states. So the, what I'm saying is it's in our hands. We know the solution. And you can look at yourself as an observer, 
or as a change agent. Given the fact that you have this analysis, go work with the community colleges. Uh, you know, Urbana has a great uh, computer science and engineering program. You can start helping them, absolutely. And to that point, Princeton taking transfer students for the first time this year. They actively resisted it yeah. for a long time, yes. Hello, Kristen. I'm Kristen Sharp from uh, New America. I run the SHIFT initiative there. And my question is right on this topic, and it's a, it sort of builds on a number of the things that we've asked, which is that we seem like we have three really separated and specific um, approaches to higher education. We have on-the-job training, apprenticeship, and sort of employer-led learning. We have community colleges, and we have four-year institutions. And is there some way beyond a specific community college to four-year articulation agreement or something that is a specific to the, the two institutions that are thinking about it to integrate those things further so that we have phase one education, phase two education, phase three education, all of which are interchangeable it's, with one it's another. It's a continuum. It's a lifelong learning. It, but people don't care anymore. Look, I was interviewing somebody who was at Stanford to recruit him. And I asked him, where did you start? He's a, he's a very well-known faculty, very distinguished. Okay, where did you start? He started at, at, as, as a community college at LACC. Who cares? You know, but, so but that's another uh, uh, point. You have people, or, you know, what we have to look at is the human being. And, you know, the human being and providing opportunities for human beings. Rather than, and I agree with my colleague over there, rather than having these antiquated situations where we look down. Okay. Yes. So I'm kind of interested. Could you in identify yourself? Oh, so I'm. Please. Yeah. I'm Justin Piccarelli. I'm from the University of Wyoming. I teach public administration. Um, so I'm interested in, in what happens when we sit down with potential employers. Um, at the table and kind of allow them to begin shaping education. I right? was hoping that you would ask the question. Okay. They don't shape education. They don't know about that. Okay. They don't know about that. Actually, what all they want is tell you the desiderata. This is what we're looking for. We surveyed uh, three years ago or four years ago, we surveyed employers, CEOs, nationwide survey, you know, and then the first thing they say, you know, people who have uh, technical knowledge are not enough for us. The first thing they tell you, they said it, in, and it's in the survey, you can look at it. We say, what do you need? We need people who can understand how to work with other people. We need people who can uh, uh, empathize with other people. We need people who have s are system thinkers, right, but et cetera. So they will never tell you, go, you know, we want, this specific uh, uh, chapter or in the curriculum. They will not tell you that. And, you know, th this is very clear. Look at, uh, so we have this fear that we will be polluted if we have an employer sitting down like they did in Maryland for cybersecurity and saying, those are the desiderata. They don't, they know nothing beyond the desiderata. So as a follow-up, are you at all worried that by kind of having that pressure that we might be shifting education away from other things. It, I'm worried about you, the way you're asking your question because well, it's a biased way by saying, yeah, I, by, you know, by putting the pressure, by shifting. They don't put pressure. You, you, you have the... Are, the are, you, are you saying that the purpose of education should be more than just employability? I, no, I'm, but it, that, is a, that I agree with you. If you're saying yeah. that, but all the examples, and talk to my colleagues, when they sit down with you, they are not there to put pressure. We think that we are polluted by talking to people. Yeah. Well, that, you know, I, I don't think it's the case. So I'm saying that by putting something in, you might be pushing something out. Absolutely, and we are doing that already. We are pushing some, something out because we have created, going back to what he said, silos in higher education, and we have pushed out the integration. We do it. Don't worry, we, you have tenure, at least you ha you're young. I don't know I whether don't. you have tenure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. You, you, you know. Um, don't, don't, don't worry about being polluted. You are the leader. And you went into education because 
you don't worry about taking stands. So let's stop being worried about uh, being polluted. We, 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 are, we can change the world. Yes. We're going to have John Mitchell, and you're going to tell so, him who you interviewed from Stanford, I think. Yeah. Go ahead, John. No, we're not, we're, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, Could you identify yourself? I, I'm, I know I'm, John, I'm John Mitchell. I teach at Stanford. Uh, I'm just looking at the outline of, of what you've said. Humanics, this is a curricular issue. Experiential education is, in some sense, a pedagogical issue. And the move toward to embrace lifelong learning is a structural issue. And uh, <clears throat> the What's your field? What's uh, your field? Computer science. Computer science, because you're a typologist. You provided the typology. It's a great typology, but, that, but I would disagree with the way you framed it. Okay. Because I think everyone has three, the three yeah. components you okay. mentioned. So, but it doesn't uh, matter. That's a footnote. But I, I, I do have a question. Uh, it, one part of it is that I think the latter two have been with us for some time. And what is new at this moment is the curricular need and what is being driven by the AI innovation and the way that that's changing things. So there's some hope that that will drive progress in the other two directions. So that, I would think, is a positive way of looking at this. The question I wanted to ask is, for research universities and research institutions, how do you see these goals and very reasonable aims around our educational process uh, connecting with uh, our research activities, and can you comment on your thoughts on that? that? That's a great question. First of all, let me mention as a, as a small note, historically, when higher education started years ago, Bologna and before Bologna, it, it wasn't uh, siloed. It was more integration. And you, know, you, don't, you don't know whether Spinoza was a physicist or a, a, a philosopher, okay? We, so it came later on. Now, you are raising a question about uh, research and, the value in, and also the integration between research and learning and the balance. Uh, okay, yes. Re it, first of all, I, I, let me give you some uh, generalization that are true in higher education. If you look at higher education, higher education has three types of workforce. You're a typologist, I'm trying to emulate you. One, is the teacher scholar which is, who is the tenured faculty. Second is the faculty who is purely doing research in, uh, and nothing else, the research faculty. And third is the faculty who's doing only uh, and, you know, uh, teaching. And we call them uh, lecturers, we call them adjuncts, we call, now they're trying to union, whatever it is. If you look at what happened in the United States in the last 20 years, and you look at the growth in, throughout universities, including the research universities, I'm looking at the macro level, I'm not looking at uh, your institution or mine or whatever. The growth is where? Where do you think the growth in terms of number? Teaching. Teaching. So what does it tell you? It tells you that we have realized that the one model is not sustainable by itself in higher education. I'm not defending or attacking it. And that we have increased the teaching for economic reasons. So we are going to see more and more of that at all levels in all universities, whether it's lecturers or TAs or whatever. So you are seeing more bifurcation, whether it's good or not, that's a different matter. But that's what you are seeing. We are and I half answered your question. The other half we can talk later. I think we're going to make this our last uh, question. Go ahead. Bobby Schnabel, University of Colorado computer scientist. This may be more tactical, but I think it's an important part. Part of the lifelong learning approach that has been proposed is that universities themselves kind of contract with their own graduates to provide something for the duration of their lives. Do you see that as playing yeah, some it's, part of it, this? It, this is being discussed as a shift from uh, the uh, tuition model to the subscription model. And you are, see, you are seeing more and more that happening. And it takes different forms. My colleague here, uh, the president of CMU, is taking note because uh, he, he wants to implement it tomorrow morning. <laughs> so yes, you are seeing that. You are seeing that, and it takes different colors. For instance, saying 
all the alumni will have uh, a discount, you know, after whatever it is, or you are part of a club for life when, when you join. Yes, you are seeing a shift there. You're absolutely right. Please join me. Uh, I'm sorry, Jim. Jim's the organizer, so yeah, go Jim, ahead. I w yeah, thank you, Jim. Yeah, th thank, uh, thank you again for inviting me uh, today. And, uh, y you know, it's interesting, for instance, our, our humanity for, uh, humanities folks uh, launched the, the notion of experiential uh, liberal arts and humanics, precisely working on that. They, you know, they, uh, there, there are two aspects. One is the fact that, uh, you know, now humanities can be at the center again but people feel under attack because the, s the students are not flocking in terms of majors there. But if you look at the demand, the demand is there and the integration will allow humanities to be at the center stage again. You know, you cannot uh, start thinking about doing computer science in, without integrating psychology, philosophy, uh, p you know, privacy issues in law, uh, you know, business aspects, etc. So they are at the center stage. They are under siege. They feel they are under siege, whereas in fact, they have to, to be at the center. And the, it can be done, uh, absolutely. It's always entertaining to, uh, to listen to you Thank and you. always I always learn something new. So please join me in Thank thanking you. President Ubi being with us.